Well, good morning. Hello. Happy Saturday. I hope everybody is doing well today. Um, I know it's very early. Thank you so much for the host, Riddy. I know it's insanely early for you. Thank you for being here. It's okay if you koala a little bit. Um, I just wanted to get some more uh, done um, because life has been so busy. I've been having to cancel and rearrange and move streams and I just um, I wanted to get some more progress done in something so I figured it's early Saturday morning I don't have a ton of energy yet I'm still kind of waking up myself um, I know you guys are probably a little tired too so I'm just gonna do some nice relaxing reading uh, we're gonna get through five chapters of the book today another third of the book um, feel free to relax nap sip your coffee, eat your cereal, whatever you want to do this morning, or if you're catching this later, um, whatever you want to do. So, but thank you for being here. Um, hopefully you guys can still hear the music okay and still hear me clearly over it. Uh, just let me know if anything sounds out of balance as we go along. I'm just going to take a little sip of water because I'm a little thirsty. I actually didn't make coffee this morning. I know. <clears throat> Thank you. Okay. Without further ado, jumping into chapter 5. Until dawn comes, we cannot speak. No words can come from this sad beak. My head is spinning again, Violet said, holding the scrap of paper so Klaus and Sunny could see what's written on it. And my legs are all wobbly and my body is buzzing, like I've been struck by lightning. How in the world did Isadora get another poem here? We made sure that one of us was watching the tree at every moment. Maybe it was here yesterday, but Hector didn't see it, Klaus said. Violet shook her head. A white scrap of paper is so easy to see next to all these black feathers. It must have arrived here sometime in the night, but how? How it got here is the least of our uh, questions, Klaus said. Where are the quagmires? That's the question I want answered. Why doesn't Isadora just tell us, Violet said, rereading the couplet and frowning, instead of leaving us in mysterious poems on the ground where anybody could find them. Maybe that's why, Klaus said slowly. Anyone could find them out here on the ground. If Isadora simply wrote out where they were, and Count Olaf found the scrap of paper, he'd move them, or worse. I'm not that experienced with reading poetry, but I bet Isadora is telling us where she and her brother are. It must be hidden somewhere inside the poem. It'll be difficult to find, Violet said, rereading the couplet. There are so many confusing things about this poem. Why does she say beak? Isadora has a nose and a mouth, not a beak. Cra, Sunny said, which meant she probably means the beak of a VFD crow. You might be right, Violet agreed, but why does she say that no words can come from it? Of course no words can come from a beak. Birds can't talk. Actually, some birds can, Klaus said. I read an ornolo ornithological encyclopedia that discussed the parrot and the mina bird, which both can imitate human speech. But there aren't any parrots or mina birds around here, Violet said. There are only crows, and crows certainly can't speak. And speaking of speaking, Klaus said, why does the poem say, until dawn comes, we cannot speak? Well, both these poems arrived in the morning, Violet said. Maybe Isadora means that she can only send us poems in the morning. None of this makes any sense, Klaus said. Maybe Hector can help us figure out what's gone wrong. Laper, Sunny said in agreement, and the children went to wake up the handyman who was still asleep on the front porch. Violet touched his shoulder, and as he yawned and sat up, the children could see that his face had lines on it from sleeping on the picnic table. Good morning, Baudelaire's, he said, stretching his arms and giving them a sleepy smile. At least I hope it's a good morning. Did you find any sign of the quagmires? It's more like a strange morning, Violet replied. We found a sign of them, all right. Take a look. Violet handed Hector the second poem, and he read it and frowned. Curiouser and curiouser, he said, quoting one of the Baudelaire's favorite books. This is really turning into a puzzle. But a puzzle is just something you do for amusement, Klaus said. Duncan and Isadora are in grave danger. If we don't figure out what these poems are trying to tell us, Count Olaf will... Don't even say it, Violet said with a shiver. We must absolutely solve this puzzle, and that is that. Hector stood up to stretch and looked out on the flat and empty horizon surrounding his home. 
Judging by the angle of the sun, he said, it's just about time to leave. We don't even have time for breakfast. Leave? Violet asked. Of course, Hector said. Are you forgetting how many chores we have ahead of us today? He reached into the pocket of his overalls and pulled out a list. We begin downtown, of course, so the crows don't get in our way. We have to trim Mrs. Morrow's hedges, wash Mr. Lesko's windows, polish all the doorknobs at the Verhugan family's mansion. Plus, we have to sweep all the feathers out of the street and take out everyone's garbage and recyclables. But the quagmire kidnapping is much more important than any of those things, Violet said. Hector sighed. I agree with you, he said, but I'm not going to argue with the Council of Elders. They make me too skittish. I'll be happy to explain the situation to them, Klaus said. No, Hector decided, it will be best to do our chores as usual. Go wash your faces, Baudelaire's, and then we'll go. The Baudelaire's looked at one another in dismay, wishing that the handyman wasn't quite so afraid of a group of old people wearing crow-shaped hats. But without further discussion, they walked back into the house, washed their faces, and followed Hector across the flat landscape until they reached the outskirts of town and then through the uptown district, where the VFD crows were roosting until they reached the downtown house of Mrs. Morrow, who was waiting in her pink robe on her front porch. Without a word, she handed Hector a pair of hedge clippers, which are nothing more than large scissors designed to cut branches and leaves rather than paper, and gave each Baudelaire a large plastic bag to gather up the leaves and branches that Hector would snip off. Hedge clippers and a plastic bag are not appropriate methods of greeting someone, of course, particularly first thing in the morning, but the three siblings were so busy thinking about what the poems could mean that they scarcely noticed. As they gathered up the hedge trimmings, they floated several theories. The phrase floated several theories here means talked quietly about the two couplets by Isadora Quagmire, until the hedge looked nice and neat and it was time to walk down the block to where Mr. Lesko lived. Mr. Lesko, whom the Baudelaire's recognized as the man in the plaid pants who was worried that the children might have to live with him, was even ruder than Mrs. Morrow. He merely pointed at a pile of window cleaning supplies, then stomped back into his house. But once again, the Baudelaire's were concentrating on solving the mystery of the two messages they had been left and scarcely noticed Mr. Lesko's rudeness. Violet and Klaus each began scrubbing dirt off a window with a damp rag while Sonny stood by with a bucket of soapy water and Hector climbed up to clean the windows on the second floor, but all the children thought of was each line of Isadora's confusing poem until they were finished with the windows and were ready to go to work on the rest of the chores for the day, which I will not describe for you, not only because they were so boring I would fall asleep while writing them down on paper, but because the Baudelaire orphans scarcely noticed them. The children thought about the couplets while they polished the Verhugan doorknobs and they thought about them when they swept the feathers from the street into a dustpan that Sunny held while crawling in front of her siblings, but they still could not imagine how Isadora managed to leave a poem underneath Nevermore Tree. They thought about the couplets as they carried the garbage and recyclables from all of VFD's downtown residents, and they thought about them as they ate a lunch of cabbage sandwiches that one of VFD's restaurant owners had agreed to provide as his part in the village's attempt to raise the children, but they still could not figure out what Isadora was trying to tell them. They thought of the couplets when Hector read out the list of afternoon chores, which included such tedious duties such as making citizens' beds, washing townspeople's dishes, preparing enough hot fudge sundaes for the entire Council of Elders to enjoy as an afternoon snack, and polishing foul fountain. But no matter how hard they thought, the Budlers got no closer to solving the couplets' mysteries. I'm very impressed with how hard you three children are working, Hector said as he and the children began their last afternoon chore. Foul Fountain was made in the shape of an enormous crow, and it stood in the middle of the uptown district, in a courtyard with many different streets leading out of it. The children were scrubbing at the crow's metal body, which was covered in carvings of feather shapes to make it look realistic. Hector was standing on a ladder scrubbing at the crow's metal head, which was facing straight up and spitting a steady stream of water out of a hole fashioned to look like its mouth, as if the enormous bird were gargling and spitting water all over its own body. The effect was hideous, but the VFD crows must have thought differently because the fountain was covered in feathers that they had left that they had left behind during their uptown morning roost. When the Council of Elders told me that the village was serving as your guardian, Hector continued, I was afraid that three small children wouldn't be able to do all these chores without complaining. We're used to strenuous exercise, Viola replied. When we lived in Paltryville, we debarked trees and sawed them into boards, and at Proof Rock Preparatory School, we had to run hundreds of laps every night. Besides, Klaus said, we're so busy thinking about the couplets that we've scarcely noticed our work. I thought that's why you were so quiet, Hector said. How do the poems go again? The Baudelaire's had looked at the two scraps of paper so many times over the course of the day that they could recite both poems from memory. For sapphires, we are held in here. Only you can end our fear, Violet said. 
Until dawn comes, we cannot speak. No words can come from this sad beak, Klaus said. Dolch, Sunny add, which meant something like, and we still haven't figured out what they mean. They're tricky, all right, Hector said. In fact, I... Here his voice trailed off, and the children were startled to see the handyman turn around so he was no longer facing them, and began to scrub the left eye of the metal crow, as if someone had flicked a switch that had stopped him from talking. Foul fountain still doesn't look completely clean, said a stern voice from behind the children, and the Baudelaire's turned around to see three women from the Council of Elders who had entered the courtyard and now stood frowning at them. Hector was so skittish that he didn't even look up to answer, but the children were not nearly as intimidated, a word which here means made skittish by three older women wearing crow-shaped hats. We're not completely finished cleaning it, Violet explained politely. I hope you enjoyed your hot fudge sundaes that we prepared for you earlier. They were okay, one of them said with a shrug that bobbed her crow hat slightly. Mine had too many nuts, another one of them said. Rule number 961 clearly states that the Council of Elders Hot Fudge Sundays cannot have more than 15 pieces of nuts each, and mine might have had more than that. I'm very sorry to hear that, Klaus said, not adding that anyone who is so picky about a hot fudge sundae should just make it themselves. We've stacked up the dirty ice cream dishes in the snack hut, one said. Tomorrow afternoon you'll wash them as part of your uptown chores. But we came to tell Hector something. The children looked up to the top of the ladder, thinking that Hector would have to turn around and speak to them now, no matter how skittish he was. But he merely gave a little cough and turned, con and turned to continue scrubbing at Foul Fountain. Violet remembered what her father had taught her to say when he was unable to come to the phone, and she spoke up. "'I'm sorry,' she said. "'Hector is occupied at the moment. May I give him a message?' The elders looked at one another and nodded, which made it look like their hats were pecking at one another. "'I suppose so,' one of them said." If we can trust a little girl like you to deliver it. The message is very important, the second one said, and once again I find it necessary to use the expression bolt from the blue. You would think after the mysterious appearance of not one but two poems by Isadora Quagmire at the base of Nevermore Tree that no more bolts from the blue would appear in the village of VFD. <clears throat> a bolt of lightning, after all, rarely comes down from a clear blue sky and strikes the exact same place more than once. But for the Baudelaire orphans, life seemed to be little else than bolt after unfortunate bolt from the blue. Ever since Mr. Poe had delivered the first bolt from the blue in telling them that their parents had been killed. And no matter how many bolts from the blue they experienced, their heads never spun any less, and their legs never got any less wobbly, and their bodies never buzzed any less with astonishment than when another bolt from the blue arrived. So when the Baudelaire's heard the elder's message, they almost had to sit down in foul fountain because the message was such an utter surprise. It was a message that they thought they may never hear, and it is a message that only reaches me in my most pleasant dreams, which are few and far between. The message is this, said the third member of the Council of Elders, and she leaned her head in close so the children could see every feather of her crow hat. Count Olaf has been captured, she said, and the Baudelaire's felt as if a bolt of lightning had struck them once more. End of chapter five. <coughs> Might be napping, might not, can't tell with them glasses. When I don't eat cereal, even no cereal anymore. Or drink coffee. Awesome shirt, thank you. I'll sing it up, oh yeah, curiouser and curiouser. The feathers, children, the feathers. Aww. You put your hedge clippers in plastic bag away. I hope they're cabbage hot fudge sundaes. Foul fountain is fun to say. Way easier than Shasta said, shoulders, soldiers. Oh, to her. I am so thirsty this morning. <clears throat> Let me text my mom back. She's at the grocery store.
Thank you for clapping. I hope you're enjoying. Chapter 6. <clears throat> Although jumping to conclusions is an expression rather than an activity, it is as dangerous as jumping off a cliff, jumping in front of a moving train, and jumping for joy. If you jump off a cliff, you have a very good chance of experiencing a painful landing unless there's something below you to cushion your fall, such as a body of water or an immense pile of tissue paper. If you jump in front of a moving train, you have a very good chance of experiencing a painful voyage unless you are wearing some sort of train-proof suit. And if you jump for joy, you have a very good chance of experiencing a painful bump on the head unless you make sure you are standing someplace with very high ceilings, which joyous people rarely do. Clearly, the solution to anything involving jumping is either to make sure you're jumping to a safe place or to not jump at all. But it is hard not to jump at all when you are jumping to conclusions, and it is impossible to make sure that you are jumping to a safe place, because all jumping to conclusions means is that you are believing something is true, even though you don't actually know whether it is or not. When the Baudelaire orphans heard from the three members of VFD's Council of Elders that Count Olaf had been captured, they were so excited that they immediately jumped to the conclusion that it was true. It's true, said one of the elders, which didn't help things any. A man arrived in town this morning with one eyebrow and a tattoo of an eye on his ankle. It must be Olaf, Violet said, jumping to conclusions. Of course it is, the second council member said. He matched the description that Mr. Poe gave us, so we arrested him immediately. So it's true, Klaus said, joining his sister in the jump. You've really captured Count Olaf. Of course it's true, the third woman said impatiently. We've even contacted the Daily Punctilio and they'll write a story about it. Soon the whole world will know that Count Olaf has been captured at last. Hooray! cried Sunny, the last Baudelaire to jump to conclusions. The Council of Elders has called a special meeting, said the woman who appeared to be the eldest elder. Her crow hat bobbed in excitement as she spoke. All citizens are required to go to Town Hall immediately to discuss what, what is to be done to him. After all, rule number 19,833 clearly states that no villains are allowed within the city limits. The usual punishment for breaking a rule is burning at the stake. Burning at the stake, Violet said. Of course, an elder said. Whenever we capture rule breakers, we tie them to a wooden pole and light a fire underneath their feet. That's is, this is why I warned you about the number of nuts on my hot fudge sundae. It would be a shame to light you on fire. You mean the punishment is the same no matter what rule you break? Klaus asked. Of course, the elder replied. El uh, rule number two clearly states that anyone who breaks a rule is burned at the stake. If we didn't burn a rule breaker at the stake, we would be rule breakers ourselves, and someone else would have to burn us at the stake. Understand? Sort of, Violet said, although in truth she didn't understand it at all. None of the Baudelaire's did. Although they despised Count Olaf, the children did not like the idea of lighting him on fire. Burning a villain at the stake felt like something a villain would do, rather than something done by foul devotees. But Count Olaf isn't just a rule breaker, Klaus said, choosing his words very carefully. He's committed all sorts of terrible crimes. It would seem best to turn him over to the authorities rather than burning him at the stake. Well, that's something we can talk about at the meeting, a councilwoman said, and we'd better hurry or we'll be late. Hector, get down from that ladder. Hector didn't answer, but he got down from the ladder and followed the three members of the Council of Elders away from Foul Fountain, keeping his eyes on the ground at all times. The Baudelaire's followed Hector, their stomachs fluttering as they walked through the uptown district to the downtown one, where the crows were roosting as they had been yesterday, when the children had first arrived in VFD. Their stomachs were fluttering with relief and excitement because they believed that Count Olaf had been captured, but also with nervousness and fear because they hated the idea that he might be burned at the stake. The punishment for VFD rule breakers made the Baudelaire's remember their parents' deaths, and they did not like the idea of anyone being lit on fire, no matter how vile of a person they were. It was unpleasant to feel relief, excitement, nervousness, and fear all at once, and by the time they arrived at Town Hall, the stomachs of the Baudelaire orphans were as fluttery as the crows, which were muttering and scuffling as far as the eye could see. When one's stomach is all fluttery like that, it is nice to take a short break to lie down and perhaps sip a fizzy beverage, but there was no time for such things. The three members of the council led the way to the large room in Town Hall decorated with portraits of crows. The room was in pandemonium, a phrase which here means filled with elders and townspeople standing around arguing. The Baudelaire scanned the room for a sign of Olaf, but it was impossible to see anyone over the bobbing crow heads. We need to begin the meeting, called one of the uh, council. Elders, find your places on the bench. Townspeople, find your places on folding chairs. The townspeople 
stopped talking at once and hurried into their seats, perhaps afraid that they would be burned at the stake if they didn't sit down quickly enough. Violet and Klaus sat down next to Hector, who was still staring at the floor in silence, and picked up Sonny so she could see. Hector, please place Officer Luciana and Count Olaf on the platform for discussion, an elder ordered as the last townspeople sat down. There's no need, called out a grand voice from the back of the room, and the children turned around to see Officer Luciana with a big red grin beneath the visor of her helmet. I can get to the platform myself. After all, I am the ch chief of police. That's true, another elder said, and several other people on the bench nodded their crow hats in agreement as Luciana strolled to the platform, each of her black boots making a loud clunk on the shiny floor. I'm proud to say, Officer Luciana said proudly, that I've already made the first arrest of my career as chief of police. Isn't that smashing? Here, here, cried several tr townspeople. And now, Luciana continued, let's meet the man we're all dying to burn at the stake, Count Olaf. With a grand gesture, Officer Luciana stepped off the platform, clunked to the back of the room, and dragged a frightened-looking man out of a folding chair. He was dressed in a rumpled suit with a large rip across the shoulder and a pair of shiny silver handcuffs. He wasn't wearing any shoes or socks, and as Officer Luciana marched him to the platform, the children could see that he had a tattoo of an eye on his left ankle, just like Count Olaf had. And when he turned his head and gazed around the room, the children could see that he had only one eyebrow instead of two, just like Count Olaf had. But the children could also see that he wasn't Count Olaf. He wasn't as tall as Count Olaf, and he wasn't quite as thin, and there wasn't dirt under his fingernails or a nasty and greedy look in his eyes. But most of all, the Baudelaire's could see he wasn't Count Olaf the way you could tell that a stranger wasn't your uncle, even if he was wearing the same polka dot coat and curly wig your uncle always wore. The three siblings looked at one another and then at the man being dragged onto the platform and they realized with a sinking feeling that they had been jumping to conclusions about Olaf's capture. Ladies and gentlemen, Officer Luciana said, and orphans, I give you Count Olaf. But I'm not Count Olaf, the man cried. My name is Jock and... Silence, commanded one of the mean, meanest looking members of the Council of Elders. Excuse me. Rule number 920 clearly states that no one may talk while on the platform. Let's burn him at the stake, cried a voice, and the children turned to see Mr. Lesko standing up and pointing at the trembling man on the platform. We haven't burned anyone at the stake for a long time. Several members of the council nodded their heads. That's a good point, one of them said. He's Olaf, all right, Mrs. Morrow called from the far side of the room. He has one eyebrow instead of two, and there's a tattoo of an eye on his ankle. But lots of people have only one eyebrow, Jack cried, and I have a tattoo as part of my job. And your job is villain, Mr. Lesko called out triumphantly. Rule number 19,833 clearly states that no villains are allowed within the city limits, so we get to burn you at the stake. Here, here, called several voices in agreement. I'm not a villain, Jack cried frantically. I work for the volunteer. Enough is enough, said one of the youngest elders. Olaf, you have already been warned about Rule 920. You are not allowed to speak when you are on the platform. Do any more citizens wish to speak before we schedule the burning of Olaf at the stake? Violet stood up, which is not an easy thing to do if your head is still spinning, your legs are still wobbly, and your body is still buzzing with astonishment. I wish to speak, she said. The town of VFD is my guardian, and so I am a citizen. Klaus, who had Sonny in his arms, stood up and took his place beside his sister. This man, he said, pointing at Jack, is not Count Olaf. Officer Luciana has made a mistake in arresting him, and we don't want to make things worse by burning an innocent man at the stake. Jack gave the children a grateful smile, but Officer Luciana turned around and clunked over to where the Baudelaire's were standing. The children could not see her eyes because the visor on her helmet was still down, but her bright red lips curled into a tight smile. It is you who are making things worse, she said, and then turned to the Council of Elders. Obviously, the shock of seeing Count Olaf has confused these children, she said to them. Of course it has, agreed an elder. Speaking as a member of the town serving as their legal guardian, I say that these children clearly need to be put to bed. Now, are there any adults who wish to speak? The Baudelaire's looked over at Hector in the hopes that he would overcome his nervousness and stand up to speak. Surely he didn't believe that the three siblings were so confused that they did not know who Count Olaf was. But Hector did not rise to the occasion a phrase which here means continued to sit in his folding chair with his eyes cast downward, and after a moment, the Council of Elders closed the matter. I hereby close the matter, an elder said. Hector, please take the Baudelaire's home. Yes, called out a member of the Verhugan family. Put the orphans to bed and burn Olaf at the stake. Hear, hear, several voices cried. One of the Council of Elders shook his head. It's too late to burn anyone at the stake today, he said, and there was a mutter of disappointment from the townspeople. 
We will burn Count Olaf at the stake right after breakfast, he continued. All uptown residents should bring flaming torches, and all downtown residents should bring wood for kindling and some sort of healthy snack. See you tomorrow. And in the meantime, Officer Luciana announced, I will keep him in the uptown jail, across from Foul, foul Fountain. But I'm innocent, the man on the platform cried. Please listen to me, I beg of you. I'm not Count Olaf, my name is Jack. He turned to the three siblings who could see he had tears in his eyes. Baudelaire's, he said. I'm so relieved to see you're alive. Your parents, that's enough out of you, Officer Luciana said, clasping her white gloved hand over Jack's mouth. Pip it, Sonny shrieked, which meant wait. But Officer Luciana either didn't listen or didn't care, and she quickly dragged Jack out the door before he could say another word. The townspeople rose up in their folding chairs to watch him go, and then began talking among themselves as the Council of Elders left the bench. The Baudelaire saw Mr. Lesko share a joke with the Verhugan family as if the entire evening had been a jolly party instead of a meeting sentencing an innocent man to death. Pip it, Sonny shrieked again, but nobody listened. His eyes still on the floor, Hector took Violet and Klaus by the hand and led them out of town hall. The handyman did not say a word, and the Baudelaire's didn't either. Their stomachs felt too fluttery and their hearts too heavy to even open their mouths. As they left the council meeting without another glimpse of Jock, Jack or Officer Luciana, they felt a pain even worse than that of jumping to conclusions. The children felt as if they jumped off a cliff or jumped in front of a moving train. As they stepped out of town hall into the still night air, the Baudelaire orphans felt as if they would never jump for joy again. That's the end of chapter six. Let me catch up on chat. What if I jump for a joy in front of a train in front of a cliff? Oh, that sounds scary. Hey, Sed, good morning. It's great to see you here. Hope you're well. I clunk everywhere I go. I don't know a lot of people with one eyebrow. He probably Olaf. Yeah, this is a, like a Nintendo music, relaxing Nintendo music compilation. <clears throat> I think it can be a jolly party and a death sentencing. Oh, thank you for clapping. Thank you very much, Sed. I appreciate that. <clears throat> I'm trying to get through the series on stream since it's my fave. Okay, I have three more chapters to read today. I'm just gonna press along. Chapter seven. In this large and fierce world of ours, there are many, many unpleasant places to be. You can be in a river swimming with angry electric eels or in a supermarket filled with vicious long distance runners. You can be in a hotel that has no room service or you can be lost in a forest that's slowly filling up with water. You can be in a hornet's nest or in an abandoned airport or in the office of a pediatric surgeon, but one of the most unpleasant things that can happen is to find yourself in a quandary, which is where the Baudelaire orphans found themselves that night. Finding yourself in a quandary means that everything seems confusing and dangerous and you don't know what in the world to do about it, and it is one of the worst unpleasantries that you can encounter. The three Baudelaire's sat in Hector's kitchen as the handyman prepared another Mexican dinner, and compared with the quandary they were in, all their other problems felt like the small potatoes he was chopping into thirds. Everything seems confusing, Violet said glumly. The quagmire triplets are somewhere nearby, but we don't know where, and the only clues we have are two confusing poems. And now there's a man who is not Count Olaf, but he has an eye tattooed on his ankle, and he wanted to tell us something about our parents. It's more than confusing, Klaus said. It's dangerous. We need to rescue the Quagmires before Count Olaf does something dreadful, and we need to convince the Council of Elders that the man they arrested is really Jack, otherwise they'll burn him at the stake. Quandry? Sonny said, which meant something along the lines of, what in the world can we do about it? I don't know what we can do about it, Sonny, Violet replied. We spent all day trying to figure out what the poems meant, and we tried our best to convince the Council of Elders that Officer Luciana made a mistake. She and her siblings looked at Hector, who had certainly not tried his best with the Council of Elders, but instead had sat in his folding chair without saying a word. Hector sighed and looked unhappily at the children. I know I should have said something, he told them, but I was far too skittish. 
The Council of Elders is so imposing that I can never say a word in their presence. However, I can think of something that we can do to help. What is it? Klaus asked. We can enjoy these huevos rancheros, he said. Huevos rancheros are fried eggs and beans, served with tortillas and potatoes and a spicy tomato sauce. The siblings looked at one another, trying to imagine how a Mexican dish would help get them out of their quandary. How will that help? Violet asked doubt doubtfully. I don't know, Hector admitted. But they're almost ready, and my recipe is a delicious one if I do say so myself. Come on, let's eat. Maybe a good dinner will help you think of something. The children sighed but nodded their heads in agreement as, and got up to set the table. And curiously enough, a good dinner did in fact help the Baudelaire's think of something. As Violet took her first bite of beans, she felt the gears and levers of her inventing brain spring into action. As Klaus dipped his tortilla into the spicy tomato sauce, he began to think of books he had read that might be helpful. And as Sunny smeared egg yolks all over her face, she clicked her four sharp teeth together and tried to think of a way that they might be useful. By the time the Baudelaire's were finishing the meal Hector had prepared for them, their ideas had grown and developed into full-fledged plans, just as Nevermore Tree had grown a long time ago from a tiny seed, and Foul Fountain had recently been built from someone's hideous blueprint. It was Sunny who spoke up first. Plan, she said. What is it, Sunny? Klaus asked. With a tiny finger covered in tomato sauce, Sunny pointed out the window at Nevermore Tree, which was covered in the VFD crows as it was every evening. Mergen, sir, she said firmly. My sister says that tomorrow morning there will probably be another poem from Isadora in the same spot, Klaus explained to Hector. She wants to spend the night underneath the tree. She's so small that whoever is delivering the poems probably won't spot her, and she'll be able to find out how the couplets are getting to us. And that should bring us closer to finding the quagmires, Violet said. That's a good plan, Sonny. My goodness, Sonny, Hector said. Won't you be frightened spending all night underneath a whole murder of crows? The real. Sonny said, which meant it won't be any more frightening than the time I climbed up an elevator shaft with my teeth. I think I have a good plan too, Klaus said. Hector, yesterday you told us about the secret library you have in the barn. Shh, Hector said, looking around the kitchen. Not so loud, you know it's against the rules to have all those books and I don't want to be burned at the stake. I don't want anyone to be burned at the stake, Klaus said. Now does the secret library contain books about the rules of VFD? Absolutely, Hector said, lots of them. Because the rule books describe people breaking the rules, they break rule number 108, which clearly states that the VFD library cannot contain any books that break any of the rules. Well, I'm going to read as many rule books as I can, Klaus said. There must be a way to save Jack from being burned at the stake, and I'll bet I'll find it in the pages of those books. My word, Klaus, Hector said. Won't you be bored reading all those rule books? It won't be any more boring than the time I had to read all about grammar in order to save Aunt Josephine, he replied. Sonny is working to save the quagmires, Violet said, and Klaus is working to save Jack. I've got to work to save us. What do you mean? Klaus asked. Well, I think Count Olaf must be behind all this trouble, Violet said. Greb, Sonny said, which meant as usual. If the town of VFD burns Jack at the stake, Violet continued, then everyone will think Count Olaf is dead. I bet the Daily Punctilia will even have a story that says so. It will be very good news for Olaf, the real one, that is. If everyone thinks he's dead, Olaf can be as treacherous as he likes, and the authorities won't come looking for him. <clears throat> That's true, Klaus said. Count Olaf must have found Jack, whoever he is, and brought him into town. He knew that Officer Luciano would think he was Olaf, but what does that have to do with saving us? Well, if we rescue the Quagmires and prove that Jack is innocent, Violet said, Count Olaf will come after us, and we can't rely on the Council of Elders to protect us. Poe, Sunny said. Or Mr. Poe, Violet agreed. That's why we'll need a way to save ourselves. She turned to Hector. Yesterday you told us about your self-sustaining hot air mobile home. Hector looked around the kitchen again to make sure no one was listening. Yes, he said, but I think I'm going to stop work on it. If the Council of Elders learns that I'm breaking rule number 67, I could be burned at the stake. Anyway, I can't seem to get the engine to work. If you don't mind, I'd like to take a look at it, Violet said. Maybe I could help finish it. You wanted to use the self-sustaining hot air mobile home to escape from VFD and the Council of Elders and everything else that makes you skittish, but it would also make an excellent escape vehicle. Maybe, maybe it could be both. Hector said shyly and reached across the table to pat Sonny on the shoulder. I very much enjoy the company of you three children, and it would be delightful to share a mobile home with you. There's plenty of room in the self-sustaining hot air mobile home, and once we get it to work, we could launch it and never come down. Count Olaf and his associates would never be able to bother you again. What do you think? The three Baudelaire's listened closely to Hector's suggestion, and when they tried to tell him what they thought, it felt like they were in a quandary all over again. 
On one hand, it would be exciting to live in such an unusual way, and the thought of being safe forever from Count Olaf's evil clutches was very appealing to say the least. Violet looked at her baby sister and thought about the promise she had made when Sunny was born, that she would always look after her younger siblings and make sure they wouldn't get into trouble. Klaus looked at Hector, who was the only citizen in this vile village who really seemed to care about the children as a guardian should. And Sunny looked out the window at the evening sky and remembered the first time she and her siblings saw the VFD crows fly in superlative circles and wished that they too could escape from all their worries. But on the other hand, the Baudelaire's felt that flying away from all their trouble and living forever up in the sky didn't seem to be a proper way to live one's life. Sunny was a baby. Klaus was only 12, and even Violet, the eldest, was 14, which is not really so old. The Baudelaire's had many things they hoped to accomplish on the ground, and they weren't sure they could simply abandon all those hopes so early in their lives. The Baudelaire's sat at the table and thought about Hector's plan, and it seemed to the children as if they'd spent the rest of their lives floating around the heavens, they simply wouldn't be in their element a phrase which here means in the sort of home the three siblings would prefer. First things first, Violet said finally, hoping she wasn't hurting Hector's feelings. Before we make a decision about the rest of our lives, let's get Duncan and Isadora out of Olaf's clutches. And make sure Jack won't be burned at the stake, Klaus said. Albaco, Sunny added, which meant something like, and let's solve the mystery of VFD that the Quagmires told us about. Hector sighed. You're right, he said. Those things are more important, even if they do make me skittish. Well, let's take Sunny to the tree, and then it's off to the barn where the library and inventing studio are. It looks like it's going to be another long night, but hopefully this time we won't be barking up the wrong tree. The Baudelaire smiled at the handyman and followed him out into the night, which was cool and breezy and filled with the sounds of the murder of crows settling down for the night. They kept on smiling as they separated, with Sunny crawling toward Nevermore Tree and the two older, older Baudelaire's following Hector to the barn. And they continued to smile as they began to put each of their plans into action. Violet smiled because Hector's inventing studio was very well equipped, with plenty of pliers and glue and wire and everything her inventing brain needed, and because Hector's self-sustaining hot air mobile home was an enormous fascinating mechanism, just the sort of challenging invention she loved to work on. Klaus smiled because Hector's library was very comfortable with some good sturdy tables and cushioned chairs just perfect for reading in, and because the books on the rules of VFD were very thick and full of difficult words, just the sort of challenging reading he enjoyed. And Sunny smiled because there were several dead branches of Nevermore Tree that had fallen to the ground, so she would have something to gnaw on as she hid and waited for the next couplet to arrive. The children were in their elements. Violet was in her element at the inventing studio, and Klaus was in his element at the library, and Sunny was in hers just from being low to the ground and near something she could bite. Violet tied her hair up in a ribbon to keep it out of her eyes, and Klaus polished his glasses, and Sunny stretched her mouth to get her teeth ready for the task ahead of her, and the three siblings smiled more than they had since their arrival in town. The Baudelaire orphans were in their elements, and they hoped that being in their elements would lead them out of their quandary. It's the end of chapter 7. up oh you have no idea what's happened is this is the seventh book oh i'm sorry <laughs> oh thank you so much for the host summer how are you good morning um huevos rancheros always helps violet make it happen reading aloud is an underrated art form too bad more don't uh yeah up to something nice and arrest. <clears throat> Two more chapters to go. Press on. Chapter 8 The next morning began with a colorful and lengthy surprise, which Sunny saw from her hiding place at the bottom of Nevermore Tree. It continued with the sounds of awakening crows, which Klaus heard from the library in the barn, and followed with the sight of the birds making their familiar circle in the sky, which Violet saw just as she was leaving the inventing studio. 
By the time Klaus joined his sister outside the barn and Sunny crawled across the flat landscape to reach them, the birds had stopped circling and were flying together uptown, and the morning was so pretty and peaceful that as I describe it, I can almost forget that it was a very, very sad morning for me. A morning that I wish I could strike forever from the Snicket calendar. But I can't erase this day any more than I can write a happy ending to this book, for the simple reason that the story does not go that way. No matter how lovely the morning was or how confident the Baudelaire's felt about what they had discovered over the course of the night, there isn't a happy ending on the horizon of this story any more than there was an elephant on the horizon of VFD. Good morning, Violet said to Klaus and yawned. Good morning, Klaus replied. He was holding two books in his arms, but nevertheless he managed to wave at Sunny, who was still crawling toward them. How did everything go with Hector in the inventing studio? Well, Hector fell asleep a few hours ago, Violet said, but I discovered a few small flaws in the self-sustaining hot airmobile home. The engine conductivity was low due to some problems with the electromagnetic generator Hector built. This meant that the inflation rate of the balloons was often uneven, so I reconfigured some key conduits. Also, the, circu the water circulation system was run on ill-fitting pipes, which meant that the self-sustaining aspect of the food center probably wouldn't last as long as it should, so I rerouted some of the aquacycling. Ning! Sunny called as she reached her siblings. <clears throat> Good morning, Sunny, Klaus said. Violet was just telling me that she noticed a few things wrong with Hector's invention, but she thinks she fixed them. Well, I'd like to test the whole device out before we go up in it, if there's time, Violet said, picking up Sunny and holding her. But I think everything should work pretty well. It's a fascinating invention. A small group of people could really spend the rest of their lives safely in the air. Did you discover anything in the library? Well, first, I discovered that books about VFD rules are actually quite fascinating, Klaus said. Rule number 19, for instance, clearly states that, the, that only pens are acceptable within the city limits. That the only pens that are acceptable within the city limits are ones made from the feathers of crows. And yet, rule number 39 clearly states that it's illegal to make anything out of crow feathers. How can the townspeople obey both rules at once? Maybe they don't have any pens at all? Violet said, but that's not important. Did you discover anything helpful in the rule books? Yes, Klaus said, and opened one of the books he was carrying. Listen to this. Rule number 2493 clearly states that any person who is going to be burned at the stake has the opportunity to make a speech right before the fire is lit. We can go to the uptown jail this morning and make sure Jack gets that opportunity. In his speech, he can tell people who he really is and why he has that tattoo. But he tried to do that yesterday at the meeting, Violet said. Nobody believed him. Nobody even listened to him. I was thinking the same thing, Klaus said, opening the second book, until I read this. Toei? Sunny asked, which meant something like, is there a rule that clearly states that people must listen to speeches? No, Klaus replied, this isn't a rule book. This is a book about psychology, the study of the mind. It was removed from the library because there's a chapter about the Cherokee tribe of North America. They make all sorts of things out of feathers, which breaks rule number 39. This is ridiculous, Violet said. I agree, Klaus said, but I'm glad this book was here instead of in town because it gave me an idea. There's a chapter here about mob psychology. Was a? Sunny asked. A mob is a crowd of people, Klaus explained, usually an angry one. Like the townspeople and the Council of Elders yesterday, Violet said, in Town Hall. They were incredibly angry. Exactly, Klaus said. Now listen to this. The middle Baudelaire opened the second book and began to read out loud. S the subliminal emotional tenor of a mob's unruliness lies in solitary opinions, expressed emphatically at various points in the stereo field. Tenor? Stereo? Violet asked. It sounds like you're talking about opera. This book uses a lot of complicated words, Klaus said, but luckily there was a dictionary in Hector's library. It had been removed from VFD because it defined the phrase mechanical device. All that sentence means is that, that if a few people, scattered throughout the crowd, began to shout their opinions, soon the whole mob will agree with them. It happened in the council meeting yesterday. A few people said angry things and soon the whole room was angry. Vu, Sunny said, which meant yes, I remember that. When we get to the jail, Klaus said, we'll make sure that Jack is allowed to give his speech. Then as he explains himself, we'll scatter ourselves throughout the crowd and shout things like, I believe him and hear, hear. Mob psychology should make everyone demand Jack's freedom. Do you really think it'll work? Violet asked. Well, I'd prefer to test it first, Klaus said, just like you'd prefer to test the self-sustaining hot airmobile home. But we don't have time. Now, Sonny, what did you discover from spending the night under the tree? Sunny held up one of her small hands to show them another scrap of paper. Couplet, she cried out triumphantly, and her siblings gathered around to read it. The first thing you read contains the clue, an initial way to speak to you. Good work, Sunny, Violet said. This is definitely another poem by Isadora Quagmire. And it seems to lead us back to the first poem, Klaus said. It says, the first thing you read contains the clue. Red contains the clue. 
But what does an initial way to speak to you mean? Violet said, initials like VFD? Maybe, Klaus replied, but the word initial can also mean first. I think Isadora means that this is the first way she can speak to us through these poems. But we already know that, Violet said. The Quagmires wouldn't have, wouldn't have to tell us. Let's look at all the poems together. Maybe it'll give us a complete picture. Violet took the other two poems out of her pocket and the three children looked at them together. For sapphires we are held in here. Only you can end our fear. Until dawn comes we cannot speak. No words can come from this sad beak. The first thing you read contains the clue, an initial way to speak to you. The part about the beak is still the most confusing, Klaus said. Lake Ofris, Sunny said, which meant, I think I can explain that. The crows are delivering the couplets. How can that be possible? Violet asked. Lloyd, yeah, Sunny answered. She meant something like, I'm absolutely sure that nobody approached the tree all night, and at dawn the note dropped down from the branches of the tree. I've heard of carrier pigeons, Klaus said. Those are birds that carry messages for a living, but I've never heard of carrier crows. Maybe they don't know that they're carrier crows, Violet said. The quagmires could be attaching the scraps of paper to the crows in some way, putting them in their beaks or in their feathers, and then the poems come loose when they sleep in Nevermore Tree. The triplets must be somewhere in town, but where? Co! Sonny cried, pointing to the poems. Sonny's right, Klaus said excitedly. It says, until dawn comes, we cannot speak. That means they're attaching the poems in the morning when the crows roost uptown. Well, that's one more reason to get uptown, Violet replied. We can save Jack before he's burned at the stake and search for the quagmires. Without you, Sonny, we wouldn't know where to look for the quagmires. Hesserin, Sonny said, which meant, and without you, Klaus, we wouldn't know how to save Jack. And without you, Violet, Klaus said, we'd have no ch chance of escaping from this town. And if we keep standing here, Violet said, we won't save anybody. Let's go wake up Hector and get moving. The Council of Elders said they'd burn Jack at the stake right after breakfast. Yikes, Sonny said, which meant that doesn't give us much time. So the Baudelaire's didn't take much time walking into the barn and through Hector's library, which was so massive that the two Baudelaire sisters could not believe that Klaus had managed to find helpful information among the shelves and shelves of books. There were bookshelves so tall you had to stand on a ladder to reach their highest shelves, and ones so short you had to crawl on the floor to read their titles. There were books that looked too heavy to move and books that looked too light to stay in one place, and there were books that looked so dull that the sisters could not imagine anyone reading them. But these were the books that were still stacked in huge heaps, spread out on the tables after Klaus's all-night reading session. Violet and Sunny wanted to pause for a moment and take it all in, but they knew they didn't have much time. Behind the last bookshelf of the library was Hector's inventing studio, where Klaus and Sunny got their first glimpse of the self-sustaining hot airmobile home, which was a marvelous contraption. Twelve enormous baskets, each about the size of a small room, were stacked up in the corner, connected by all sorts of different tubes, pipes, and wires, and circled around the baskets were a series of large metal tanks, wooden grates, glass jugs, paper bags, plastic containers, and rolls of twine, along with a number of large mechanical devices with buttons, switches, and gears, and a big pile of deflated balloons. The self-sustaining hot air mobile home was so immense and complicated that it, rem that it reminded the two younger Baudelaire's of what they thought of when they pictured Violet's inventive brain, and every piece of it looked so interesting that Klaus and Sonny could scarcely decide what to look at first. The, ba the Baudelaire's knew that they didn't have much time, so rather than explain the invention to her siblings, Violet walked quickly over to one of the baskets, which Klaus and Sonny were surprised to see contained a bed, which in turn contained a sleeping Hector. Good morning, the handyman said when Violet gently shook him awake. It is a good morning, she replied. We've discovered some marvelous things. We'll explain everything on our way uptown. Uptown, Hector said, stepping out of the basket. But the crows are roosting uptown. We do the downtown chores in the morning, remember? We're not doing any chores this morning, Klaus said firmly. That's one of the things we need to explain. Hector yawned, stretched, and rubbed his eyes and smiled at the three children. Well, fire away, he said, using a phrase which here means begin telling me about your plans. The siblings led Hector back through the inventing studio and secret library and waited while he walked, locked up the barn. Then as they took their first few steps across the flat landscape, wow, flat landscape toward the uptown district, the Baudelaire orphans fired away. Violet told Hector about the improvements she had made on his invention, and Klaus told him about what he had learned in Hector's library, and Sunny told him, with some translation help from her siblings, about her discovery of how Isadora's poems were being delivered. By the time the Baudelaire's were unrolling the last scrap of paper and showing Hector the third couplet, they had already reached the crow-covered crow -covered outskirts of VFD's uptown district. My nose is itchy. So the quagmires are somewhere in the uptown district, Hector said. But where? I don't know, Violet admitted, but we'd better try to save Jack first. Which way is the uptown jail? Violet asked Hector. It's across from Foul Fountain, the handyman replied. 
But it looks like we won't need directions. Look what's ahead of us. The children looked and could see some of the townspeople holding flaming torches and walking about a block ahead of them. It must be after breakfast, Klaus said. Let's hurry. The Baudelaire's walked as quickly as they could between the muttering crows roosting on the ground, with Hector trailing skittishly behind them, and soon they rounded a corner and reached Foul Fountain, or at least what they could see of it. The fountain was swarming with crows who were fluttering their wings in the water to give themselves a morning bath, and the Baudelaire's could scarcely see one metal feather of the hideous landmark. Across the courtyard with a, was a building with bars on the windows, and crows on the bars, and the torch-carrying citizens were standing in a half-circle around the door of the building. More VFD citizens were arriving from every direction, and the three children could see a few crow-hatted members of the Council of Elders standing together and listening to something Mrs. Morrow was saving, saying. "'It seems we arrived in the nick of time,' Violet said. "'We'd better scatter ourselves throughout the crowd.' Sunny, you move to the far left, I'll take the far right. Roger, Sunny said, and began crawling her way through the half circle of people. I think I'll just stay here, Hector said quietly, looking down at the ground, but the children had no time to argue with him. Klaus began to walk straight down the middle of the crowd. Wait, Klaus called, moving with difficulty through the people. Rule number 2493 clearly states that any person who's going to be burned at the stake has the opportunity to make a speech right before the fire is lit. Yes, Violet cried from the right-hand side of the crowd. Let Jack be heard! Officer Luciana stepped right in front of Violet, who almost bumped her head on the chief's shiny helmet. Beneath the visor of the helmet, Violet could see Luciana's lipsticked mouth rise in a very small smile. It's too late for that, she said, and a few townspeople around her murmured in agreement. With a clunk of one boot, she stepped aside and let Violet see what had happened. From the left-hand side of the crowd... Sonny crawled over the shoes of the person standing closest to the jail, and Klaus peered over Mr. Lesko's shoulder to get a good look at what everyone was staring at. Jack was lying on the ground with his eyes closed, and two members of the Council of Elders were pulling a white sheet over him, as if they were tucking him in for a nap. But as dearly as I wish I could write that it was so, he was not sleeping. The Baudelaire's had reached the uptown jail before the citizens of VFD could burn him at the stake but they still had not arrived in the nick of time. End of chapter eight. I hope you enjoy your lurk summer. Sorry about your latency terror. It's amazing Sunny can say so much in so few syllables, yeah. Uptown girl. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> no mochos. Not a nap. <clears throat> One more chapter to go. Chapter 9 There are not very many people in the world who enjoy delivering bad news, but I'm sorry to say that Mrs. Morrow was one of them. When she caught sight of the Baudelaire orphans gathered around Jack, she rushed across the courtyard to tell them the details. Wait until the Daily Punctilio hears about this, she said enthusiastically, and pointed at Jack with a sleeve of her pink robe. Before he could be burned at the stake, Count Omar was murdered mysteriously in his jail cell. Count Olaf, corrected Violet automatically. So you're finally admitting that you know who he is, she cried triumphantly. We don't know who he is, Klaus insisted, picking up his baby sister who was quietly beginning to cry. We only know that he is an innocent man. Officer Luciana clunked forward, and the crowd of townspeople and elders parted to let her walk right up to the children. "'I don't think this is a matter for children to discuss,' she said, and raised her white glove hands in the air to get the crowd's attention. "'Citizens of VFD,' she said grandly, "'I locked Count Olaf in the uptown jail last night, and when I arrived here in the morning, he had been killed. I have the only key to the jail, so his death is quite a mystery.' A mystery, Mrs. Morrow said excitedly as the townspeople murmured behind her. What a thrill to be hearing about a mystery. Short, 
Sunny said tearfully. She meant something like, A dead man is not a thrill! But only her siblings were listening to her. You will all be happy to know that the famous Detective Dupin has agreed to investigate this murder, Officer Luciana continued. He is inside the uptown jail right now examining the scene of the crime. The famous Detective Dupin, Mr. Lesko said, just imagine. I've never heard of him, said a nearby elder. Me neither, Mr. Lesko admitted, but I'm sure he's very famous. What happened? Violet asked, trying not to look at the white sheet on the ground. How was Jacques... How was Jack killed? Why wasn't anyone guarding him? How could someone have gotten into his cell if you locked it? Luciana turned around and faced Violet, who could see her own astonished reflection in the policewoman's shiny helmet. As I said before, Luciana said again, I don't think this is a matter for children to discuss. Perhaps that man in overalls should take you children to a playground instead of a murder scene. Or downtown to do the morning chores, another elder said, his crow hat nodding. Hector, take the orphans away. Not so fast, called a voice from the doorway of the uptown jail. It was a voice, I am sorry to say, that the Baudelaire orphans recognized in an instant. The voice was wheezy and scratchy, and it had a sinister smile to it as if the person talking were telling a joke. But it was not a voice that made the children want to laugh at a punchline. It was the voice a children recognized from all the places they had traveled since their parents had died, and the voice a children knew, the children knew, from all their most displeasing nightmares. It was the voice of Count Olaf. The children's hearts sank and they turned to see Olaf standing in the doorway of the jail, wearing another of his absurd disguises. He was wearing a turquoise blazer that was so brightly colored it made the Baudelaire squint, and a pair of silver pants decorated with tiny mirrors that glinted in the morning sun. A pair of enormous sunglasses covered the entire upper half of his face, hiding his one eyebrow and his shiny, shiny eyes. On his feet were a pair of bright green plastic shoes with yellow plastic lightning bolts sticking out of them, covering his ankle and hiding his tattoo. But most unpleasant of all was the fact that Olaf was wearing no shirt, only a thick gold chain with a detective's badge in the center of it. The Baudelaire's could see his pale and hairy chest peeking out at them, and it added an extra layer of unpleasantness to their fear. It's just not cool. Count Olaf said, snapping his fingers to emphasize the word cool. To dismiss suspects from the scene of the crime until De Detective Dupin gives the okay. But surely the orphans aren't suspects, one of the elders said. They're only children, after all. It's just not cool, Count Olaf said, snapping his fingers again, to disagree with Detective Dupin. I agree, Count Officer Luciana said and gave Olaf a big lipstick smile as he stepped through the doorway. Now let's get down to business, Dupin. Do you have any important information? We have some important information, Klaus said boldly. This man is not Detective Dupin. There are a few gasps from the crowd. He's Count Olaf. You mean Count Omar, Mrs. Morrow said. We mean Olaf, Violet said, and then turned so she was looking Count Olaf right in the sunglasses. Those sunglasses may be hiding your eyebrow, and those shoes may be hiding your tattoo, but you cannot hide your identity. You're Count Olaf, and you cad kidnapped the Quagmire triplets and murdered Jack. Who in the world is Jack? asked an elder. I'm confused. It's not cool, Olaf said with a snap, to be confused, so let me see if I can help you. He pointed at himself with a flourish. I am the dete famous Detective Dupin. I am wearing these plastic shoes and sunglasses because they're cool. Count Olaf is the name of the man who was murdered last night, and these three children, here Olaf paused to make sure everyone was listening, are responsible for the crime. Don't be ridiculous, Olaf, Klaus said disgustedly. Olaf smiled nastily at all three Baudelaire's. You are making a mistake when you call me Count Olaf, he said, and if you continue to call me that, you will see exactly how big a mistake you are making. Detective Dupin turned and tur looked up to address the crowd. Of course, the biggest mistake these children have made is thinking that they can get away with murder. There was a murmur of agreement from the crowd. I never trusted those kids, Mrs. Morrow said. They didn't do a very good job when they trimmed my hedges. Show them the evidence, Officer Luciana said, and Detective Dupin snapped his fingers. It's not cool, he said, to accuse people of murder without any evidence, but luckily, I found some. He reached into the pocket of his blazer and brought out a long pink ribbon decorated with plastic daisies. I found this right outside Count Olaf's jail cell, he said. It's a ribbon, the exact kind of ribbon that Violet Baudelaire uses to tie up her hair. 
The townspeople gasped, and Violet turned to see that the citizens of VFD were looking at her with suspicion and fear, which are not pleasant ways to be looked at. That's not my ribbon, Violet cried, taking her own hair ribbon out of her pocket. My hair ribbon is right here. How can we tell? An elder asked with a frown. All hair ribbons look alike. They don't look alike, Klaus said. The one found at the murder scene is fancy and pink. My sister prefers plain ribbons, and she hates the color pink. And inside the cell, Detective Dupin continued as if Klaus had not spoken, I found this. He held up a small circle made of glass. This is one of the lenses in Klaus's glasses. But my glasses aren't missing any lenses, Klaus cried, and everyone turned to look at him in suspicion and fear. He took his glasses off and showed them to the crowd. You can see them for yourself if you want. Just because you've replaced your ribbon and your lenses, Officer Luciana said, doesn't mean you're not murderers. Actually, they're not murderers, Detective Dupin said. They're accomplices. He leaned forward so he was right in the Baudelaire's faces and the children could smell his sour breath as he continued talking. You orphans are not smart enough to know what the word accomplice means, but it means helper of murderers. We know what the word accomplice means, Klaus said, but what are you talking about? I'm talking about the four tooth marks on Count Olaf's body. Detective Dupin said with a snap of his fingers. There's only one person uncool enough to bite people to death, and that's Sonny Baudelaire. It's true that her teeth are sharp, another member of the council said. I noticed that when she served my hot fudge sundae. Our sister did not bite anyone to death, Violet said indignantly, a word which here means in defense of an innocent baby. Detective Dupin is lying. It's not cool to accuse me of lying, Dupin replied. Instead of accusing other people of things, why don't you three children tell us where you were last night? We were at Hector's house, Klaus said. He'll tell you himself. The middle Baudelaire stood up on tiptoe and called out over the crowd. Hector, tell everyone that we were with you. The citizens looked this way and that, and crow hats of the elders bobbed as they listened for a word from Hector. Hector, But no word came. The three children waited for a moment in the tense silence, thinking that surely Hector would overcome his skittishness in order to save them. But the handyman was quiet. The only sound the children could hear was the splashing of foul fountain and the muttering of the roosting crows. Hector sometimes gets skittish in front of crowds, Violet explained, but it's true. I spent the night working in his studio and Klaus in reading in the secret library and... Enough nonsense, Officer Luciana said. Do you really expect us to believe that our fine handyman is building mechanical devices and has a secret library? Next, I suppose you'll say he's building things out of feathers. It's bad enough that you killed Count Olaf and Hector... An elder said, but now you're trying to frame Hector for other crimes? I say that VFD no longer serve as guardian for such terrible orphans. Here, here, cried several voices scattered in the crowd, just as the children had planned to do themselves. I will send a message to Mr. Poe right away, the elder continued, and the banker will come and remove them in a few days. A few days is too long to wait, Mrs. Morrow said, and several citizens cheered in agreement. These children need to be taken care of as quickly as possible. I say we burn them at the stake, cried Mr. Lesko, who stepped forward to wag his finger at the children. Rule number 201 clearly states no murdering. But we didn't murder anyone, Violet cried. A ribbon, a lens, and some bite marks are not enough evidence to accuse someone of murder. It's enough evidence for me, an elder cried. We already have the torches. Let's burn them right now. Hold on another moment, an elder said. We can't simply burn people at the stake whenever we want. The Baudelaire's looked at one another, relieved that one citizen seemed to Im immune to the mob psychology. I have a very important appointment in ten minutes, the elder continued, so it's too late to do it now. How about tonight after dinner? That's no good, said another member of the council. I'm having a dinner party then. How about tomorrow afternoon? Yes, someone said from the crowd. Right after lunch, that's a perfect time. Hear, hear, Mr. Lesko cried. Hear, hear, Mrs. Morrow cried. Gladgy, Sonny cried. Hector, help us! Violet called. Please tell these people we're not murderers. I told you before, Detective Dupin said, smiling beneath his sunglasses. Only Sonny is a murderer. You two are accomplices, and I will put you all in jail where you belong. Dupin grabbed Violet and Klaus's wrist with one scraggly hand and leaned down to scoop up Sonny with the other. See you tomorrow afternoon for the burning at the stake, he called out to the rest of the crowd and dragged the struggling Baudelaire's through the door of the uptown jail. The children stumbled into a dim, grim hallway, listening to the faint sounds of the mob cheering as the door slammed behind them. "'I'm putting you in the deluxe cell,' Dupin said. "'It's the dirtiest one.' He marched them down a dark hallway with many twists and turns, and the Baudelaire's could see rows and rows of cells with their heavy doors hanging open. The only light in the jail came from tiny barred windows placed in each cell, but the children saw that every cell was empty, and each one looked dirtier than the rest." "'You'll be the one in jail before long, Olaf,' Klaus said, hoping he sounded much more certain than he felt. 
You'll never get away with this. My name is Detective Dupin, said Detective Dupin, and my only concern is bringing you three criminals to justice. But if you burn us at the stake, Violet said quickly, you'll never get your hands on the Baudelaire fortune. Dupin rounded the corner of the hallway and pushed the Baudelaire's into a small damp cell with only a small wooden bench as furniture. By the light of the barred window, the siblings could see that the cell was quite filthy as Dupin had promised. The detective reached out to pull the door closed, but with his sunglasses on it, it was too dark to see the door handle, so he had to throw off all pretense, a phrase which here means take off part of his disguise for a moment and remove his sunglasses. As much as the children hated Dupin's ridiculous disguise, it was worse to see their enemy's one eyebrow and the shiny, shiny eyes that had been haunting them for so long. Don't worry, he said in his wheezy voice. You won't be burned at the stake, not all of you at least. Tomorrow afternoon, one of you will make a miraculous escape if you consider being smuggled out of VFD by one of my assistants to be an escape. You other two will burn at the stake as planned. You bratty orphans are too stupid to realize it, but a genius like me knows that it may take a village to raise a child, but it only takes one child to inherit a fortune. The villain laughed a loud and rude laugh and began to shut the door of the cell. But I don't want to be cruel, he said, smiling to indicate that he really did want to be as cruel as possible. I'll let you three decide who gets the honor of spending the rest of their puny life with me, and who gets to burn at the stake. I'll be back at lunchtime for your decision. The Baudelaire orphans listened to the wheezy giggle of their enemy as he slammed the cell door and walked back down the hallway in his plastic shoes, and felt a sinking feeling in their stomachs where the huevos rancheros Hector had made for them last night were still being digested. When something is being digested, of course it is getting smaller and smaller as the body uses up all of the nutrients inside the food, but it didn't feel that way to the ch three children. The youngsters did not feel as if the small potatoes they had eaten for dinner were getting smaller. The Baudelaire orphans huddled together in the dim light and listened to the laughter echo against the walls of the uptown jail and wondered just how large the potatoes of their lives would grow. And that's the end of chapter 9. My nose is so itchy, I don't know why. I'm not picking my nose, it just itches so bad. Public koala ink. I feel Snicket loves delivering bad news <laughs> in all series of books. Oh gosh, Tear. Wheezy and scratchy, Mr. Poe. Oh, it Olaf. Violet, how could you murder Olaf? Dupin is right. The classic after lunch burning, a lovely tradition. Lovely. That's all I'm reading for now, and then I'll read the final ch four chapters the next time. Thank you for the claps. Thank you for the claps. Thank you to everyone who is here, who, who chatted, and who just listened. I hope you're having a great rest of the, uh, I hope you have a great rest of the day. Sorry for kind of a short stream, only at, at an hour and 12 minutes so far, but, um, I thank you so much for joining. I'm glad you didn't think I was picking my nose. Um, thank you so much for joining. I hope you guys have a wonderful rest of your Saturday. I hope it's full of lots of fun things, lots of laughs um, with family, friends, or whatever you've got planned today. I just hope it's good. Um, as always, much love from me to you. Please take care of yourselves. I'll leave you with a little bit of music, and I will see you guys again tomorrow afternoon. Bye-bye!